Uh, interesting. I was looking at some of the things. Uh, uh, we're going to be joined in a second here. Dr. William Rosenberg is with us. Uh, Dr. William Rosenberg is professor of political science at Drexel University and has been looking at all the president's men or women, if you will, and uh, the aggression by which they operate. And this sort of maybe taking a cue from the president, if you'll recall, the Supreme Court nomination, the confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh. He had questioned Amy Klobuchar, senator from Minnesota, about her drinking habits. He got rather irate at one point uh, during the confirmation hearings. And then on Friday, we heard this exchange exchange between the acting uh, attorney general, that's Matthew Whitaker, and Gerald Nadler, who is a Democrat from New York, who is the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Have you ever been asked to approve any request or action to be taken by the special counsel? Mr. Chairman, uh, I see that your five minutes is up, and so uh, I'm... We, 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 I am here, I'm here voluntarily. I, we have agreed to five-minute rounds, and... I think that's a fine place to end the five-minute rule. Okay. okay, for both, the Yiddish term chutzpah comes to mind. The term relates to a sense of shameless audacity or impudence, while sometimes this refers to a positive attribute. Here it does not, so says Bill Rosenberg. Uh, Dr. Bill Rosenberg tweeting at Dr. B. Rosenberg. Bill, welcome back. Thanks for being here today. Good morning. I wonder, and do you think this reflects their own styles, or does this reflect what they think the president wants to hear? In other words, are they communicating to the public what they think the president wants them to communicate, or at least is the manner of communication something that they think he would approve? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I want to be careful also to say that not everyone in the Trump administration acts with such uh, behavior, uh, in effect, being so indignant. But over a number of decades of observing uh, politics and including uh, uh, numbers of uh, hearings before Congress going all the way back to Watergate. Um, These are two remarkable experiences to sort of uh, see. Um, Both of these individuals, uh, uh, we had uh, Kavanaugh and uh, Whitaker, uh, were just sort of so over the top. And I think that what was really being displayed here is that part of this is their personal behavior, but also to show that to the president that they're going to they're going to have his back that they represent the way he thinks and that um, they don't really have that much to lose i mean essentially uh, when we take a look at the kavanaugh hearings he had the votes he, it would have been a really major uh, event for him to lose with the republicans in control of the senate and with whitaker he has very limited days uh, he's probably going to be out of office this week uh, so this was his last hurrah on the stage and he was going to go out out in, uh, in a ball of fire. Your point is, uh, obviously, Mike Pence is not this way. Neil Gorsuch was not this way during his confirmation hearings. Different worlds in some ways, but of course, Mike mm-hmm. Pence has all along been this sort of almost um, expressionless, uh, <laughs> just just a, just the steady eddy on, on the messaging. I was reminded for a moment of, uh, although it was different circumstances when the then Attorney General Eric Holder had been in front of uh, the committee and uh, Representative Lee Gohmert had said some things to him. And he said, you just don't want to go there. Don't go there. It was, it was one of those confrontation moments. But your point here is that we get a steady stream of, uh, of umbrage from uh, defensiveness, if you will, from people who are surrogates for the president. I guess you're including like Kellyanne Conway and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the White House press secretary, and others who speak either on behalf of the president or on behalf of themselves, but come back at you. And, and is this a bad thing? Do you think or well, not? I, th- I think the, the reality is, is that uh, the president gets the types of people he likes uh, that have a certain personality type and um, and they are serving him from his perspective in a good way. Um, others maybe d- are doing it less so. For example, um, you know, he continually lashed out at some of his appointments, for example, Jeff Sessions, even though Jeff Sessions uh, was doing the bidding in terms of policy action, exactly what the president wanted. He was not speaking as the president wanted. Uh, If you go through, there have been others, uh, Gary Cohn, for example, that, that sort of just quietly removed himself because he felt he couldn't take it really anymore, or McMaster or Maddox, who basically, uh, raised issues and then just left. Uh, Tillerson the same way. Tillerson did not go with, along with his program and essentially was removed from office. So we're really dealing with a president who has chosen who he wants, 
uh, does not have necessarily a lot of experience in politics, so doesn't necessarily know all the players. But when he finds people that are going to say and do things that he approves of, he's going full bore with them. And I would just remind you of someone like Michael Flynn, you know, with a locker up. I mean, that was a, a campaign rally. That was a style that he very much uh, embraced, and, and the president sort of embossed that on his own campaign runs. Again, Dr. William Rosenberg with us, professor of political science at Drexel University. Let's get a little 2020 vision. Over the weekend, Bill, we saw that uh, Elizabeth Warren made it official. The senator from Massachusetts says she's running the next day, then said, who knows, maybe uh, President Trump won't even be president by 2020. Maybe he'll not be a free man. Uh, The other was, of course, Amy Klobuchar, who announced yesterday that she's running and she is in Minnesota. She was in the snow. Uh, This is now 11 candidates. It seems to me that it's going to be more and more difficult for any one of them to break through. Well, I think you have an excellent point there. I mean, I'm reminded of the last presidential race on the Republican side. Uh, You can't have this many people participate in debates, uh, for example. So while they're out there and they're going to be crisscrossing the country, particularly in early primary states, um, the candidates are really going to have to differentiate themselves so that they can pull aside uh, away from the others. If we think about it, then we may easily have 15 or maybe even 18 candidates. Some of them are going to be minor candidates that are not ever going to really go very far, but many of them are major players, major players in the sense that they have positions in the Senate. Uh, They're going to be having a a voice every day. They're going to be raising questions about the Trump administration. They're going to be holding the mic. And, And essentially, what the Democrats are going to have a problem with is they're going to have to have the ability to differentiate among the various candidates to decide who they think is both electable and also strikes the right tone with the American public, not just with the activists in the Democratic Party, but with the Democratic Party as a whole, and also across to the independents. But in addition, I would also say one of the things that we don't hear too much about is the fact that there is this problem with the percentage of people who were likely to vote. If we go back to 2016, about 63 million people voted for Hillary Clinton. Uh, She beat uh, Donald Trump in terms of popular vote. He only got about 60 percent, but there was another 100 million people out there who could have voted that didn't. And to the extent to which in the Democratic Party in particular with the primaries that people are going to be drawn out to vote and support some candidate. Uh, I think that's where the, the, the important battle is going to be won because there are just too many candidates. Uh, they're, they're not refraining from stepping up to run. They're all seeming to this list out there today are all saying, well, if, if this person can run, why not me? How much is this about getting attention? I think of Marianne Williamson. I'm not trying to denigrate her attempt, but she is, a you know, Oprah's spiritual advisor. Now she is a declared candidate for the presidency. And this isn't to say that she doesn't have the right to, but is it that she thinks uh, somebody is not being represented in the broad group of candidates who are out there? Or does she just think she has a unique ability to take that uh, perception of what America wants and translate it into policy? I, I, I just wonder how much of it is that and how much of it is when you go around, you can actually raise some money and you can get a higher profile. Well, I think it's uh, all the things that you've just said, plus sort of the concept of needs and gratification sought uh, to think that they have something unique and that they're special and that they're going to come out and people are going to want to come and support them. I'm sort of reminded on a um, on a uh, sort of local government level uh, in Philadelphia, we've had this type of an issue, but on a different sort of plane in terms of race. Um, we've had a number of African Americans who have become mayors of the city of Philadelphia. But one of the concerns often is how many African Americans are going to enter the race, and if they have too many African Americans, um, will it divide up the vote and maybe as a result not yield an African American winner? At the national level, we have the same kind of thing that's taking place, but not on the basis of race, but on the basis perhaps of uh, political identity, uh, orientation on the political spectrum, and also perhaps on the issue of gender. We have more of 
major female candidates running right now than males. Um, and, uh, you know, with the, the, the quest to break the glass ceiling, it's it essentially becomes a little bit harder if there are so many people running because essentially the vote is divided. Yeah. Five, I think. I mentioned Marianne Williamson. You've got uh, Senator Kamala Harris and uh, Amy, Amy Klobuchar now is running. Um, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand in New York and, and Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts. So that... It's the, the, for now, that's, I think, what we have. Right. Uh, so and, I, and, and they all have a legitimate have? Uh, reason to run, and they sure. all have uh, a base, and essentially um, there's only so many votes uh, percentage-wise that are going to get distributed. If you remember back to the Republican plate in 2016, uh, with 15 candidates, they couldn't even hold one debate. They had the cocktail debate versus the, the evening debate, um, and no one really recovered from that cocktail debate, let's just recall. Uh, And um, additionally, um, Donald Trump was able to pick people off because he had a slightly bigger percentage in the beginning and it knocked other candidates out. And over time, he continued to enlarge the percentage of people that were going to support him. We'll see how it plays out. Dr. William Rosenberg, Bill, thanks as always for being here. All right. Have a great day. You too. Dr. William Rosenberg, professor of political science at Drexel University. Thoughts on 2020, as well as a couple of things about the presidents and all the president's men and women. He is tweeting at Dr. B. Rosenberg, R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G.